<laughs> I feel like that sometimes about me too. Um, it's lovely to see you. Um, welcome back. Thanks for coming back after coffee. It's always uh, uh, encouraging. Um, I'm going to say, say Brett, what I'm going to do is we're going to read out a sec- the Beatitudes together. And I'm going to read the first bit and then we're all going to kind of read out the second bit. Although I'm aware we might all have different Bible versions. What the heck, let's just do it. And uh, if we all say different things, that's fine. Uh, we're a church family. So uh, turn to Matthew 5. I'll read the first bit of the phrase. And then where it says for dot, 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 blessed the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. So you're, we're all going to join in with the for theirs bit, okay? For the for, I'll, oh, yeah, even better. Oh, look at this. Uh, yeah, do you know, I've still got a paper diary. I, I'm, I'm a kind of having in your hands paper person, me and Barney. Um, so none of this screen Bibles. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, I'll pray, then we're going to read this together. Uh, I'm going to say some words from Psalm 73 as a prayer. Psalm 73, look at it later. It's a prayer of um, one of God's people who sees someone climbing the ladder and he just envies it. He says, That's, I want to I climb the ladder. I want to be like that. I want to be successful and high up. And Psalm 73 just follows the, uh, the psalmist's journey of how he processes that. So maybe if you were struggling with some of the stuff that was said in that previous uh, talk, go and have a read of Psalm 73 and you'll just see exactly how the psalmist, what he does with his envy of those who are on top of the ladder. So I, I'm going to say some, I won't read the whole of it, I'm just going to pray some of this and then we'll read it out together, okay? Um, the psalmist says, uh, Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? Earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you, but as for me... It is good to be near God. I've made the sovereign Lord my refuge. And I will tell of all your deeds. And Father, we thank you that you're here with us even now. By your Holy Spirit in the person of your Son. Thank you for each other. Thank you for your word to us. Thank you that we can approach you as we are. Not with pretending or performance or even with preparation. But we can come to your throne of grace. And we say even this morning, whom have we in heaven, Father, besides you? That even though our flesh and our heart will fail, you are the portion of our heart. You are our strength. Even this week, help us to take weekend, help us to take refuge in you again. To know the blessing and the beauty and the, the wonder, the goodness of this life in your kingdom. Have mercy upon us even now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. As we turn to Matthew 5, just as Paul said, please do use this uh, weekend as a chance to... I was just saying to Paul, like, in, in many ways what I'm saying is not that complicated, it's not hard, it, it, but we just need space to talk about it together, space with the Lord, as I said last night. Just go for a walk, sit on a log, read Psalm 73, and just kind of talk to the Lord about what you've been... Space to chat with each other, and we'll have a, I think we've got some time, Paul, at the end of this one, to chat to each other. And I know that can sometimes... It doesn't sometimes work, sometimes brilliant but you know, use opportunities. So we're going to read, uh, uh, those of you who want to, is, it, is this, oh, it's the ESV, so I now have to read this. Oh, I'm, uh, I want my paper version. So I'll read the first bit, and you'll do the four, okay, for each verse. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we'll finish it there for reasons we'll see tomorrow morning. Okay, um, I've got a test for you. And don't be embarrassed by it. I want you to turn to the person next to you. uh, uh, And you've got to tell the person next to you, what is the St. Clement's vision statement? Okay. Now, just to give you a warning, I did this at at the church that I was at and no one got it. Okay. So there's there's no embarrassment. Turn to the person next to you. What is the St. Clement's vision statement? No, hide it. Yes. (laughs)
Okay, that'll do. That'll do. Okay. Let's come back together. Um, let's, uh, let's have a moment of raw honesty. Paul's not listening. Hands up if you've got absolutely no idea. Yes, there you go. Some of Paul's family. Um, that's, uh, uh, that's good. That's fine. Um, hands up if you don't care. No, no, don't do that. Uh, as I said, we did this exercise at our church as well. And I asked them to come up with what people thought St. Martin's Vision Saint was. It was, pr- it was priceless. It was just some re- genuinely funny stuff about what people thought we were excited about as a church. Now, um, having a vision statement, I think your vision statement is amazing. It's not just you want to, um, what was it? I wrote it down. Uh, it's not just that you want to spread the passion of Jesus Christ in Manchester, the UK, and the world as well. Dream big. Did, uh, people happy? Did you get it? Hands up if you got it right. Oh, okay. Oh, Paul, look. Paul took his glasses off. He doesn't want to know. I don't want to know uh, 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 about this. Uh, now, what a vision statement to spread a pra- pa- passion for Jesus Christ in the whole world. And do you know, one of the things I love about St. Clement's is I see that happening. Uh, I see it happening. Uh, in the way that you send out mission partners and support them as the, just the, the blessing that you seek to be to the world. Uh, I've said to a couple of people over coffee, I genuinely think what the Lord's doing at St. Clement's is incredible. And it's a beautiful thing what he's doing amongst you. So kind of treasure it and recognize that the Lord is with you. It's really good. Spreading a passion for Jesus in the world. But before we get too carried away, I don't know if you've heard the expression that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, now, what that means is it's all very well having a strategy, a vision, a dream, and that's brilliant. It really is. It's not a dig that. But your culture will eat your strategy for breakfast. Uh, you can have your great vision, but what will really matter is the culture that goes on amongst you at St. Mar- uh, sorry, St. Clement's. Uh, is it, uh, it's when I say Holy Trinity Platt that you know you're in trouble. Uh, um, your culture amongst you, that is what will dictate the, the effect Uh, the blessing that you're able to be on Manchester, the UK, and the world. And it will do it a long way. It will eat your strategy for breakfast. So what I want to talk about this session is your culture together as a church family. Uh, uh, What's it like to be at St. Clement's? Our first session yesterday evening, we talked about what's he like? What's Jesus like? We saw that he's a God who blesses the broken. And that's beautiful and comforting. Uh, Before coffee, we thought about what am I like individually? Uh, uh, Will I step into this life inside Jesus' kingdom? What am I like? What's he like? What am I like? Now, before uh, we have a break, we can think about what are we like together as a community, as a culture. And the next three Beatitudes, I think the Beatitudes go, the way it works is you've got your title, which is number one. Then they come in two sets of three. And so we're looking at that kind of second set of three uh, from verse seven. Uh, What are we like? If someone visited St. Clement's, spent a bit of time, uh, a guest came to the weekend away and just spent the whole weekend with us and they go away, what are they like there? What's it like with them? We're going to think about that. Um, I've spoken a lot. Let's just look at verse 7 to 9. Ignore verse 10 for the moment. Again, back in your pairs or little groups. Um, Verse 7 to 9, what is beautiful about what God's community looks like? And what's challenging about what God's community looks like, okay? What's beautiful, verse 7 to 9, what's beautiful about this and what's challenging about this, okay? Just a couple of minutes and then we'll, uh, we'll look at it together. Okay, have fun. Why don't you, why don't you do my work for me? Like, uh, sh- shout some stuff out. What's, as, just as you read that, what's, there's no kind of one right answer. I think. What's beautiful about what you just looked at? What, what's beautiful about God's community in those verses? The second part, okay, yeah. Anything else that's beautiful that you just read that and thought, yeah, I'd, I'd like to be part of that. That we are sons of God. Yes, brilliant, that's beautiful. We're sons of God, children of God together. Yeah, a diverse family where God loves each one of us uh, in the same way, yeah, it's beautiful. Oh, Linda. I, I, I know that when I, it, it, it's not satisfying paying my taxes, but it's satisfying to know that HMRC is not going to knock my door. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. Good, good, good. Anything else that's beautiful about these, um, this picture of what God's community looks like? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's beautiful. Satis- one of the things I was thinking about in that last session, what does kind of meekness mean? I was chatting to Keith and we were kind of talking about just meek, there's a kind of sense of not striving to be someone who I'm, I'm not, just resting in the place where God has placed me, knowing that he's with me and he loves me here now. But that's kind of the, post- the post- posture. We'll think about that. Anything else that's beautiful about being a part of God's community? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Josh. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, just briefly, because I think I want to focus on the positive as well. But what's the challenge of uh, living in God's community? The first part. The first part. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I, I see what you've done here. Uh, see what. <laughs> uh, anything else? Uh, there's a challenge about living in God's community. First part, second part. Other people. Other people, Linda. Yes, thank you for saying what we're all thinking. What's the challenge of living in God's community? You are, and I am. Other people, yes. We are sin- we'll talk about this. We're all sinful people, and we come together. Imagine putting a load of sinful people. Go away for a weekend together. Lock you up. You, you know, <laughs> disaster. It's awful. Other people. Okay, we'll think about that in a moment, yeah. Other challenge of uh, living in God's community here? Criticism, yeah. Self-society. Sorry? Go on. Selfish desires. Selfish desires, yeah. All sorts of things. Okay, let's look at these verses. So I think these verses, these three verses, seven, eight, nine, as I said, talk about what God's community looked like. Uh, Jesus is saying, imagine this, imagine this, imagine a kingdom where this is what is uh, happening. And we're gonna, I just want to say two things about this, and I hope this will help us. Get in imag- stir our imaginations for what uh, living in God's kingdom is to be like. But more practical, what life at St. Clement's, St. Clement's, <laughs> what your culture uh, will look like. Your values will trump your vision every time. So what are your values as a church? Firstly, Jesus says that living in his kingdom, living in his church, is a place of, it's a place of grace. It's a place of grace. Jesus says in verse 7, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. So you see, immediately here, he's changed his tactic. He's talking about how we relate to one another, who it is to be an us. And it's the blessing on those who are merciful, who treat one another with mercy. Now, p- perhaps we could talk about this in a couple of different ways. We're merciful to each other in our, in our creatureliness. And we're merciful to each other in our sin as well. Uh, merciful in our creatureliness. It's often said, isn't it, that the way a society treats its most vulnerable is the measure of its health. Pretty sobering about our society. <laughs> but it's also true of the church. The way that we treat our most um, vulnerable is a measure of our health. I don't know if you've ever been to a church where you have to be strong to survive. Uh, where to kind of be in the kind of inner circle, the inner ring, you've got to perform and work hard and be strong where those who are vulnerable and weak and broken and who have less obvious gifts are kind of just left behind and marginalized. Maybe you've been in a church like that before, where it's the gifted and the extroverts and the successful who are paraded and honored. And Jesus says, no, that, that not in my kingdom. Not in my kingdom. That will not and must not happen in my church. Jesus says that is not the way of Christ. That is not the path of blessing. The path of blessing, verse 7, is the path where we are merciful to one another. Generous, not competitive. Patient with each other, not pushy. Caring, not critical. We see one another, somebody said this just now, we see one another as children of God to be loved rather than resources to be used. Jesus says, this is what it's like in my kingdom. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. We don't manipulate one another, but we serve one another. 
Of course, again, this comes, as we've seen time and time again, from the first beatitude. Everything flows out. Once we recognize that before the Lord we are poor in spirit, that we have nothing to prove, that we're not pushy with him, that transforms the way we relate to one another. Uh, We're merciful to each other because we recognize that you're a creature with great frailty and I'm a creature with great frailty. And so we're patient and merciful, gentle with each other. But it's deeper than that as well. We're merciful to each other in our creatureliness. We're merciful to each other in our sinfulness as well. Uh, now, that's, it sounds lovely, doesn't it? Who wouldn't want to be part of a merciful, forgiving church? Um, C.S. Lewis uh, once said, everybody loves the idea of forgiveness until they have someone to forgive. <laughs> See, that's when it gets hard. And that's where Jesus kind of touches us and gets to us now. Blessed are the merciful. We're merciful in our posture towards one another, in our creatureliness. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for washing up and setting up the table for us. Um, That's really kind. But we're merciful to each other in our sinfulness as well. Or flip it around. Put it like this. At St. Clement's, how do you respond to one another when someone sins against you? How do you respond at St. Clement's when someone wrongs you? Because we've already said, we are sinful. We will sin against one another. We will wrong one another. Your leaders will sin against you and will wrong you. Your visiting speaker, just for a weekend, he will sin against you and wrong you. It will happen. You don't need persuading of that. That's the given. So the question is, how will we respond as a community given that that will happen? What does that look like at St. Clement's? I guess there's temptations. We could withdraw from one another or fight one another, fight or flight. We could withdraw from those who sin against us, avoid them, keep your distance, disengage with people who we find difficult. A friend of mine uh, arrived at a new church. Uh, uh, It was quite a small church, actually. And there were two families who hadn't spoken to each other for 25 years in a small church. Uh, that's a good way of dealing with it, isn't it? <laughs> okay, we've got problems, so we withdraw and we separate. It's going to be a lonely experience at church, isn't it? Because I will sin against you, so you'll have to hide from me. And I'll sin against you, so you'll have to hide from We could withdraw from those who we find difficult. The other option, of course, is to fight. Take them on. Hold a grudge. Now, it feels nice, doesn't it? Uh, but again, we're going to have a very aggressive culture. Everyone fighting one another. Church is a messy place full of messy people, difficult people, difficult problems, different perspectives. That's just your staff team as well. Uh, The whole church uh, will be like this. How will we treat one another in a church where we will sin against each other and we will hurt each other? We can't pretend that that won't happen. Well, Jesus says, imagine, imagine. Can you imagine a place that is different? Can you imagine a place where mercy and forgiveness is the mood of the culture? Can you imagine a place where instead of withdrawing, we move towards those who we find different? Can you imagine a place where instead of fighting one another when we wrong each other, we offer forgiveness? Can you imagine in your mind a place where if you stuff up, you're not rejected? Can you imagine a place in your mind where if you don't fit in, you're not excluded? Imagine a kingdom, imagine a church where if you've got nothing to offer, you're welcomed with open arms. And not just as a one-off before we can get you on a rotor. Imagine a place where that is the mood all the time. Where where you've got nothing, you're right at the heart. Imagine a place. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Do you see here, mercy isn't just the job of the Christian. It's the mark of the Christian. This is who we are. We have received mercy from Jesus Christ, and so we show it. And as someone uh, pointed out earlier, if we don't show mercy to others, it can only be that we have not understood the mercy of Jesus Christ ourselves. The merciful will be shown mercy. See, the heart of the gospel, the heart of the gospel is that the Father does not treat us as our sins deserve. God the Father does not withdraw from us when we stuff up and get things wrong. When we're just weak and can't quite, we just can't do it. He doesn't withdraw. And 
praise be, he doesn't fight us. He doesn't come with aggression. He is merciful to us. He's gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So we can come before him with nothing and say, Lord, here is me again, poor in spirit. And he comes to us. He chooses even more than that, the weak things of the world, to shame the wise. He's not embarrassed by weakness. In fact, as the Apostle Paul says, we boast in our weakness because that is the place where we experience the grace and the power of God. You see, the heart of the gospel, the heart of the mercy that we have received transforms the way that we relate to one another. St. Clement's can be, imagine it, a place of grace, a place of mercy, a place where you're free to fail, a place where you're free not to fit in, a place that you don't have to play by some unwritten rules that no one knows. A place of mercy and the way we show it to each other. Now, of course, that comes from the leadership and the, the top and all that, but, but much more than that, it comes from the way that we treat each other when we sin against each other, when we wrong each other, where we move towards one another in mercy or withdraw. The mercy we've received from God transforms how we relate to each other. There's a um, minister in America called Ray Ortland who I've heard, and he had the strap, the strap line for his ministry. The mantra for his life is this. He says, gospel doctrine creates a gospel culture. The doctrines of grace create a culture of grace. Don't just tell me that you believe the gospel. Show me. And, and show me when that person really annoys you. That'll show me whether you believe the gospel. Show me when that person sins against you and it's incredibly painful. That'll show us whether you believe the gospel. The blessing of God, the blessing that Jesus speaks of here are not those who can clearly articulate the catechism. It's on those who are actively merciful to one another. The mercy we've received is like a fountain which overflows. We, we, sung it, we breathe in the mercy of God. We were singing it earlier. We breathe out showing mercy to others. It may be worth asking the question, even here this weekend, is there someone that you're avoiding because in your eyes, they're just a bit kind of weak. <laughs> Is there someone that you're avoiding because they don't really have anything to offer uh, here? More than that, is there someone that you're avoiding because they've hurt you, wronged you? Is there forgiveness that needs to come in, mercy? Now, I don't want to be naive about that. I know that sometimes broken relationships can take a long time to heal. Often we're talking about years and not weeks. I know that. But there's a direction of travel there's a movement towards what Jesus is talking about here. Because Jesus says, blessed are the merciful. They will be shown mercy. What are they like at St. Clement's? It's an incredible place to be. It's beautiful because it's this just culture of mercy. But deeper than that as well. We'll go to verse 9 and we'll come back to verse 8 in a moment. Uh, what's it like? Jesus says, blessed, uh, I've lost it now, blessed are the peacemakers. For they will call uh, be called sons of God. We're still talking about it being a place of grace. Jesus says, secondly, under that, blessed are the peacemakers. In times of global war, uh, blessing on those who seek peace globally, but also true locally, also true amongst God's people when there is local war at St. Clement's. The blessing of God is on those who actively pursue peace, restoration, reconciliation. <coughs> Uh, notice uh, verse 9 doesn't say blessed are the peaceful. Uh, not even those blessed are those who yearn for peace. It doesn't even say blessed are the peacekeepers. It says blessed are those who go out of their way seeking peace, who sacrifice themselves for peace. It is they who will be called sons of God, children of God. Because of course that's exactly what our father did. He went out of his way he sacrificed himself in the person of his son to make peace with us. And Jesus, the Prince of Peace, brings us back to himself. I said we were looking at Leviticus uh, in, in our church. In Leviticus, the peace offering, it's really interesting. It's a meal. It's a fellowship. It's dwelling together in the same... It's not a kind of a reluctant acceptance. It's the, in fact, I think it's the, it's, the, it's the kind of peak of our relationship with God is that we have peace and fellowship. We eat together. And Jesus says here, blessed are the peacemakers, 
because they will be called sons of God. Now, what will that look like at your, uh, your church? I don't know. We had an incident at St. Martin's. Um, uh, this will make you want to come to our church. Uh, we, there was one older guy had a Barney with an older woman at our church. They didn't like each other anyway. And then that got a bit out, this is oh, being recorded, who cares? Uh, that got a bit out of hand. And so I stepped in to be the hero. Um, and uh, I thought, okay, I will sort this out. And would you believe I made it much worse. Uh, I said all the wrong things at every stage and it was a complete mess. And it got to the stage where the main problem in this relational disaster was, you've guessed it, me. <laughs> uh, I'd caused a complete stuff up uh, with this whole thing, pastoral disaster. But what was interesting, the next Sunday we were taking the Lord's Supper and uh, different churches do it differently. We share the peace um, of the Lord's Supper, is what uh, many churches used to do. And during that, you go around, I know it's a bit twee now, you go around and peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. But what was interesting is during the hymn before the Lord's Supper, I got a tap on my shoulder. Oh, but I promised my daughter I wasn't gonna get emotional in this uh, session. But I got a tap on my shoulder before uh, the, the hymn. And this older chap humbled himself. He, he said, uh, during the service, he tapped on my shoulder and he said, before we take the Lord's Supper together, I wanted to say sorry. The thing is, I was the one who needed to say sorry. And here was this guy in the middle of a service before we come to the table together. He said, I want to say sorry. And it kind of humbled me because in that moment, I was the one who needed to say sorry. But he's, he didn't just kind of, he doesn't, wasn't just peaceful. He didn't just yearn for peace. He went out of his way to seek peace relational togetherness before we came to the table. And do you know what Jesus says to him? Jesus says, blessed are you. Blessed are the peacemaker. You, you are a son of God. You are a child of God. Maybe it's a question for you. Have you had the opportunity to say sorry to anyone recently? Do you need to say sorry to anyone? Paul and I have talked about this before in ministry. As leaders, we know that we sin against you in the way that we lead. And there are moments when we as leaders need to say sorry. It's one of the hardest things as leaders. We've, I've had to do it at St. Martin's and far too many times. You stand up before the congregation and say, I'm sorry. I've led you in a really unhealthy way and I've treated you badly. That's really hard for us as leaders to do. But Jesus says, in that, blessed are the peacemakers. And this all flows out, of course, if before the Lord we're naked and exposed and vulnerable and poor in spirit, we have nothing to offer them. Well, what have, I don't need to prove anything to you. I don't need to come to climb the ladder to get higher up. We stand at the foot of the cross, naked together. We get to this place of mercy and peacemakers because we see each other not as rivals, but as forgiven sinners. Was it Linda who said the most difficult thing about church is, our, is the fact that we're all sinful? And that's exactly right. But the thing is, we're forgiven sinners. And so we come together, our culture is one of mercy and peace. What are they like at St. Clement's? What's it like there? It's beautiful. It's a place of grace. It is, it's all right. It's a place of mercy and grace. Imagine it. There's a flip side as well, and um, it just makes this all the more rich. Because in the middle of these two Beatitudes, we've looked at verse 7 and verse 9, and the mathematicians amongst you will know we've missed one in the middle. <laughs> verse 8. Because Jesus says, as he says that this is what uh, his church is to be like, a place of grace, in the middle, deliberately sandwiched, he says that his church is also to be a place of truth. Right in the middle. At verse 8, Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Now, of course, on one level, he's talking about the morally pure in heart, that we live pure lives. He definitely is talking about that, and that is a place of blessing. I also think it's slightly, uh, something slightly different as well, for various reasons. In Psalm 73, that I read out before, the pure in heart were those who remain faithful to the Lord rather than compromise. So when everyone else around us is kind of climbing up the ladder just to fit into the world around them, we see this in the church, just kind of accommodating to the world around, changing what we believe, because that's the easiest way to climb the ladder. Jesus says, no, the pure in heart are those who won't compromise and will hold to the truth of Jesus' word, even if that means a path of downward mobility. Uh, morally pure, but also remaining faithful to the Lord and not compromising. And Jesus says, for those who do that, blessed are the pure in heart. You see, put it like this, our pursuit of mercy and peace doesn't mean that we ignore sin. 
It doesn't mean that kind of anything goes. It doesn't mean that we just kind of throw up our hands and go, oh, you know, we're a sinful place, you sin against me, who cares? Uh, we're a sinful church. No, no, not at all. We're a place of grace. But we hold that hand in hand with being a place of truth. We don't just shrug our shoulders. Sin matters. It is dangerous. And God is a holy God. It's totally forgivable. Anything and everything. Whatever, you know, if you were here last night, whatever you wrote on that piece of paper, whatever I wrote on that piece of paper, there's some dark stuff. It's totally forgivable. But change is needed. And Jesus, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who seek change. Jesus says to me, come as you are, but don't stay as you are. Jesus is inclusive of everybody, but he also calls everybody to repent. It's awkward and hard, isn't it? I don't know if you've had to talk to someone about uh, an issue between you. That's really hard and really painful. It's hard to talk about sin. It's hard to talk about repentance. But Jesus says, this is the place of blessedness. Now, I don't know you guys well enough to know of these two issues, a place of grace and a place of truth. I don't know your church well enough to know where, where to encourage you and where to challenge you. I pray that the Spirit would do that as, as I speak. I pray that as you chat to one another, maybe that's a question that you can talk about. Um, how, do we, how are we holding those two together? What are they like at St. Clement's? Well, they're a place of grace and a place of truth. And it has to be both. Grace without truth, well, it's kind of, It's flimsy, it's kind of non-existent. It's not real, it's cheap grace. Truth without grace is awful, it's harsh, it's overbearing. Has to be both. And so we come back to uh, where we began, that one of the most beautiful things about the church is also the hardest thing about the church, is that we are a place, we are a people of forgiven sinners. And it's both. (laughs) It's wonderful to be forgiven. It's very challenging that we're all sinful. We will wrong each other. We will sin against each other. We will hurt each other. And we will annoy each other. And unless we have this deep kind of foundation, our corporate life will just be torn apart pretty, pretty quickly. How will we respond without things quickly getting messy? Well, Jesus says... Blessed are the merciful. They will be shown mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And in the midst of the mercy and the grace that we show one another, Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Uh, Finish with uh, a story. Um, People, do you like Lord of the Rings? Hate Lord of the Rings? Like? Hands up if you hate. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, there's, there's now, and there's one more tomorrow as well. So uh, just, uh, um, this, uh, too good to resist. We see these coming together, of course, this grace and truth. We see it coming together perfectly and really only fully in Jesus Christ. And in Lord of the Rings, uh, there's a character uh, called Aragorn, who's um, um, the king who will return. Uh, that's not giving away too much. Uh, and in one of the sieges, the siege of Gondor, it's the midst of one of the most bloody battles in the Lord of the Rings. Uh, Death and destruction are rampant. The darkness is closing in everywhere. And the great prophecy, the promise that people are waiting for is a king. And get this, a king, the hands of whom are both victorious in battle and the same hands that bring healing. So shall the rightful king be known. A king who is victorious in battle and whose hands bring healing. And the reason I love that is, just, for me, it's just such a beautiful picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one. He is the ultimate one who was victorious in battle, who stood for truth, who died so that the truth of himself and his father would be known. He is victorious in battle. But he's not harsh. He's not hard. His hands bring healing. And so it's as we come to him again today, this weekend, He is the one who will give us that courage and resolve to be a church who stands for the truth. And that is, you don't need me to tell you, incredibly difficult in this generation. It's incredibly difficult in the Church of England. But Jesus is the one who is victorious in battle and it's the same one whose hands bring healing. And so we as a community, you as a community, can have those soft, tender hands in the way you treat one another. Just as you stand firm, grace and truth humility and conviction, compassion and integrity.
Because only Jesus is the one who is both the lion and the lamb. Who are we? Who am I? Who is he? Jesus, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Again, let's have a moment's quiet just to reflect maybe how the Lord has spoken to you, how the Spirit maybe prompted something in your heart. Um, We're going to sing a wonderful song in a moment, but let's just take a few moments uh, before the Lord ourselves individually.